Hey, what's up, everyone? Here to introduce to you episode number 14 of the Rooster's Crow podcast. I had the pleasure of speaking with Michael Waitkoff, aka known as um, Brother Augustine. He has a YouTube channel that I'm going to go ahead and link to the description. He's also an author. He's written some books on uh, Freemasonry and books on uh, poetry, a recent book. And we talked about his past and his upbringing and growing up in the United States and living in different places. He was initially born and raised in Chicago, and then he moved uh, to Florida, North Carolina. He's uh, in California now. We talked about him going through university and his struggles with addiction and rehab. And we talked about his path towards orthodoxy that took uh, some interesting twists and turns. Uh, he was a Freemason uh, for a few years and he rose through the ranks. And it's interesting hearing his perspective um, on on his path. So, and we we ended the discussion talking about Jonathan Peugeot and Jordan Peterson and uh, their conversation they recently had. Um, so, really enjoyed connecting with him, and I hope you guys enjoy it too. So, um, episode number fourteen of the Rooster Square Podcast. I give you guys, Brother Augustine. God bless. All right, Brother Augustine, Michael, uh, thanks for joining me on the Rooster Scrow Podcast. Um, sure. How are you doing? Uh, well, I had a, an alarm set for 11.30 to remind me of this show and an alarm set for 10.30 to wake up. Slept through the first alarm, woke up with half an hour till this started, so I'm a little bit groggy, but I have my BFF black coffee right here. So hopefully, uh, as, the, as the talk goes on, hopefully my brain will kick in and and I won't be as tired as I as I was when I first started. Other than yeah. that, things are going well. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. We're actually kind of on the same playing field. I like to maybe prepare a little bit more, and I didn't have a chance to because I have uh, my three kids and my wife, and every other Saturday they're home, and so they were just going bananas. I have a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old, and mm -hmm. they were just going nuts uh, all morning. Uh, they just popped out. My God bless my wife. She's you know, I'll leave. She's going to her mom. So literally they just closed the door two minutes ago. So I haven't had a chance to gather my, my salt myself and my thoughts either. So we're in a, oh, we're in a good spot. Yeah. Good, good, good. Good deal. Um, yeah, I, I invited you on. I appreciate your channel. I've been watching it probably for the last uh, year or so. Um, don't, don't remember exactly how I found you, uh, but you know, just kind of getting into a lot of different Orthodox channels and, you know, they pop up as different people that you watch and, uh, kind of recommendations and whatnot. And, and I resonate a lot with your background, where you come from, especially, you know, um, we can get into a little bit. I know, I don't know, I've seen you've been on a, a few podcasts in the last couple of weeks, and I don't know if it gets kind of trite just going over your background again, or if you re refined it, or you can kind of get through the, the bullet points now. So I'll let you kind of uh, go into what you want to go into. But um, I guess just starting out, tell us kind of where you grew up and what that was like, uh, you know, prior to getting, you know, intellectually involved in things. Sure. No, I don't, I don't mind telling the story over and over because I, I forget parts of it half the time anyway. So then the story sounds a little different every time I tell it. Like I re remember when something happened that I forgot the time before or forgot some pivotal event. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I grew up in Chicago in a um, upper middle class, mostly Jewish neighborhood, at least as far as I know. Uh, I'm sure there were some Christians there, but we never interacted with them or had any sort of community time with them, you know. Um, even though it was a reformed Judaism, which is like the Protestant of Judaism, except even less moral because most of them don't even believe in God, it's still like a cultural community. Um, so your community is based on who you go to Hebrew school with, who's there for Sunday school, whose bar mitzvah you go to. You know, if someone doesn't invite you to their bar mitzvah or their bat mitzvah, which is for girls, you know, then you're kind of on the outs with that person and their family. Um, so, so even though Judaism as a religion was not important to anyone that I remember, uh, the cultural parts of it were very important because that was your social circle, basically. Uh, and I grew up an atheist, as I'm pretty sure most of the other people in my community did. Uh, so like when we were going to Sunday school, you know, you'd have your teaching or whatever, and then you go to the sanctuary for the service. And I never believed in it. I always thought it was stupid. I would run away to the library. Like I would sneak out and go read books about World War II and, you know, the, the Jews in the Warsaw ghetto fighting the Nazis. Like that stuff was always more interesting to me. Uh, than the God stuff that I didn't believe in at the time. Uh, and I was there till I was 18 when I went off to college. I uh, went to college at UC Santa Barbara, go Gauchos, uh, where I was exposed to drugs and partying and stuff that I had never, um, never done at all. I mean, when I got to college, I had never smoked a cigarette. I had never, never had a beer. I'd never been to a party. I had never done more than just kiss a girl. Um, 
which for some reason I had done a lot as like a six to eight year old. I got a lot of kisses as a six year old. Uh, I was a stud back then, but you know, I, I, I wasn't, didn't have girlfriends, didn't go on dates, nothing like that. There were a couple of girls I was like interested in. Um, but I was, I was kind of, uh, I don't know, awkward about it, I guess, as a lot of young guys are and young girls do are. Mm-hmm. So I get to college and basically having been exposed to none of the quote unquote bad stuff, maybe, maybe the quotes aren't necessary. I kind of went too far in the other direction, uh, which is just like, I didn't do cocaine to my junior year, but I was doing like smoking weed all the time and doing mushrooms and acid occasionally, uh, just hanging out with the bad kids, you know, um, getting into parties and fornication and this thing and that thing. And uh, it actually got so bad that between my junior and senior year, so I was 21 at the time, uh, I actually left college and went to rehab where I was. And I was out there while all my friends were graduating college. So I went to a program called Second Nature Entrada, which I believe is a different name now. We're essentially go out to uh, St. George, Utah. And then for the next three-ish months, you're just out in the Great Basin Desert wandering around the Nevada, Utah um, area. I forgot what the third state is. There's another state out there somewhere. Um, so you have no idea where you are, right? You're with a group of other, in my case, adults, because everyone had been either court ordered to be there or they were there by choice like I was. So we're wandering around the desert for months, you know, doing therapy, working on ourselves, experiencing sobriety for the first time in a long time for most of us. Um, so that was when I started getting into like the idea of spirituality, I guess. Cause it was, there was a lot of native American stuff worked into it, like ritualism and um, just different ideas. There's some called the Anasazi way that was important to some people out there. Read a book called the way of the peaceful warrior by, uh, I think Dan Millman is the guy's name. So just the idea that like, there's, there's more out there, you know, I wouldn't have classified it as new age at the time. Cause I didn't know what that meant, mm-hmm. but I never really thought about the bigger kind of invisible, ineffable ideas until then. Uh, but I didn't put too much, too much stock into it. After that, I went to Florida. That's why I was in Florida. I went to FAU for uh, one semester, Florida Atlantic University. And then went back to UC Santa Barbara and graduated with, I think I got seven A's and a B plus after I was sober. So it was a pretty mm. staggering difference between, you know, stoned me and sober me, even though stoned me still got by with like B's and B minuses. There was mm. one class I only went to four times. You know, I was one of those kids that it's kind of a curse, honestly, to be smart enough that you don't actually have to pay attention. You can skate by in life. Mm-hmm. Cause you miss all the good stuff, right? Yeah. You, it's like taking a shortcut just cause you're lazy. So at that point, um, I moved to, after I graduated, moved to North Carolina to stop me if I'm telling too much of a background here. No, 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 well, please, please. No, okay. keep so going. I moved to North Carolina to work in the wilderness therapy industry at which I had been a client when I was 21. I, uh, moved to Asheville, which was beautiful. And where I had an incredible apartment for $400 a month with two floors of a house to myself and a pool unbelievable. Um, and so I was a wilderness counselor. Um, so I was taking Mm. groups of kids out into the woods. Uh, they were 17 and younger. So those kids were not there by choice. You know, their kids, their parents would drop them off or tell them they were going to Disneyland and then send them to therapy, you know, whatever it took, or actually the worst thing they had what's called an escort service, which is not prostitution as it sounds. So this escort service, when a parent signed one of these kids up for wilderness, they would hire these two like giant dudes to essentially kidnap the child with the parent's consent in the middle of the night, throw them in the van, take them to the airport, and then bring them to the wilderness program. So now they're, they're stuck until their parents let them out, right? So this big traumatic event, which you'd think the kids would have been more upset about, but I actually never heard them complaining about it, weirdly mm-hmm. enough. Complained about everything else. Complained about me, complained about the weather, the bugs, whatever. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, as, as the one guiding them and disciplining them to some extent and giving them therapy, you know, you're the target of a lot of, a lot of their anger, but it was a lot of fun. After that, I worked in a uh, psych ward, a locked-in psych ward hmm. that I can't uh, recommend less to anybody <laughs> because uh, you were not allowed to do chemical restraints or mechanical restraints. So no sedatives, no handcuffs. Uh, so you had to hold them manually. So every time a kid got too escalated or became a threat to himself or herself or others, me and one to two other staff would tackle the person, hold them on the ground until they stopped screaming. This is not a fun job. They're spitting at you. They're biting you. They're kicking you. They're anything they can to hurt you and get you off of them, you know, uh, which is interesting because I, I swore off politics for Lent. So I haven't watched any of this. I know the Derek Chauvin, uh, George Floyd trial is going on right now. And I saw a lot of people saying, well, he said he couldn't breathe. Why wouldn't you let him up? Okay. These people have never worked in a capacity where you're dealing with people like this all the time. 
they're going to say whatever they can to get you off. They'll say they can't breathe, you're breaking their arm, uh, anything. So mm -hmm. I'm sure the officer had experienced this a thousand times. Uh, and you can't do it. You can't let them up because the only reason you're holding them in the first place is because they've gotten dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. Their level of noncompliance is a physical danger to someone. Could yeah. be themselves. You could let them up and then they kill themselves. Well, now it's your fault for not following your protocols and someone's dead on your watch. So mm -hmm. you can't just let people go because they are complaining. You can't do it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to watch the trial because that's politics and swore off of it for Lent. Afterwards, I'll look into it and figure out, you know, what happened. I'm sure I'll hear about it somehow. Yeah. After that, I moved to Hawaii. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about this with Robin Riley or not. I've done so many podcasts in the last like week and a half that it's all kind of blurry together, honestly. Um, but I went out there to Hawaii and I was in this like little hippie commune for about five months. And this is where I started to hear a lot of the new agey kind of stuff. Like a lot of people were into Buddhism and yoga was huge. Everyone there was doing yoga. There was yoga training constantly. People were, you know, talking about the divine Shakti energy and Shiva energy and um, the divine yoni, you know, a lot of like vagina worship straight up. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the divine feminine is always like a vagina shape in some capacity. Yeah. Which I was never into that part, um, like the worship of anything. Uh, but I got into doing yoga and thinking about spirituality and all that kind of stuff, which always involves like drugs and, and fornication, that type mm -hmm. of spirituality. After that, uh, I moved to California where I started working for Greenpeace after a little while. I actually worked for UPS first and then for Greenpeace. And at Greenpeace, uh, I was canvassing door to door, like knocking people's doors, asking for money. And I, I knocked on a guy's door who had a, a Masonic symbol on his door frame, a square and compass. And I'd seen the symbol over and over because I always saw it on the way to work and back. There was a big lodge right in the main freeway. So I'd always seen it and wondered what it was. So I said, what is this symbol about? said, oh, this is uh, it's Freemasonry. So well, what's Freemasonry? Sounds kind of familiar. So, oh, it's the world's biggest and oldest fraternity. I said, okay, cool. What do you guys do there? He said, you know, we have rituals and, you know, we don't talk about it publicly. Um, and so that just fascinated me. Like there's mm -hmm. this big, big giant group of people with these secrets that they don't talk about. That really like wormed its way into my brain. So one day after work, me and the girl I had been canvassing with uh, went to the big Masonic lodge in town in our Greenpeace uniform still. And everyone there is in a business suit. So it's kind of funny looking contra uh, contrast. And I said to one of the guys who ended up being one of my, you know, role models and mentors in masonry. I didn't know him at the time. I said, Hey, what is all this stuff about? He said, uh, masonry is meant to make good men better. That's usually their, um, uh, the, the slogan they tell people. Sounds great. Yeah. Or not right. a We're not a secret society with, we're, we're a society with secrets. Stuff like that. Like they have all these little kind of things they're taught to tell people. I mean, it's depending on how you look at it, it's not entirely untrue because contrary to what people think, the, the ethics they teach are good. Like the morality they teach is just in line with, you know, most moral teaching, like don't be bad. Don't accept money you didn't work for. Don't steal. Don't uh, violate the chastity of another master mason's wife or daughter. It's part of mm -hmm. the third degree oath. Hmm. You know, don't sleep with your friend's daughters, basically, uh, or wives, stuff like that. Um, and so I tried to join and I had only been in California at the time for nine months and they have a rule. You have to be in the state for a year before you join. Hmm. Um, and I don't remember whether I waited three months or just convinced them to let me in anyway. Cause again, I was, uh, by this time I was smoking a lot of weed again. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how that happened, but I, I joined 2015 and I just, I loved it. I loved everything about it. I love dressing up in a suit hanging out with these older, like successful guys that had businesses, a lot of military people, like a lot of my friends now are military, but I never like been around military people before. Cause why would I? Mm -hmm. So a lot of Masons are military, they're cops, firefighters, things of that nature, uh, business people. Not everyone is. I mean, some you, you, and you don't know the difference, which is one of the things I really liked. Everyone is the same there. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. That's what it means. Treating people on the level, like the grand master of the lodge, and some janitor who happens to be a Freemason treat each other the same way, maybe with a little more respect in one direction, but you treat everyone the same, which I, I like. That's why I said that I like the morality that they teach there. And then I got deeper into it. So once you become a third degree Mason, a master Mason, you can then join all the kind of extra groups like the Shriners and the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. I avoided the Shriners because I was not interested in Arabic anything mm -hmm. um, or anything that looked Muslim to me. You know, Muhammad, from what I'm told, is involved in that degree. It's not into it. Uh, but I joined the York Rite and the Scottish Rite, 
um, and got to the 32nd degree in the Scottish Rite, which you get on your first day. So it's actually not that impressive. It's not how mm -hmm. it was designed. But that's how it is now in the southern jurisdiction of uh, the Scottish Rite in America. And the York Rite, I went through all three bodies and became a Knight Templar, which I thought was really cool. Now, interestingly enough, um, to be a Knight Templar, they ask you, like, are you willing to defend uh, Christianity or something like that? Mm -hmm. I said to them at the time, well, I'm Jewish, I'm not Christian, but yeah, I mean, I, I think this morality is good. And I don't see any reason why I wouldn't, you know, help defend. So they let me in, right? Now, from that point, there's other, so there are, there are people in these groups that are part of more quiet groups that don't advertise, that if they notice you thinking in a certain way or talking about certain topics, they might tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, come check this out. We think you'd, you'd really like this other thing. Mm -hmm. So that happened to me in a, a couple of different groups. One of them was called Allied Masonic Degrees, which is just lectures on basically whatever topic you want to give. So I gave topics on Hermeticism and Baphomet symbolism and things. Other people do it on like the history of cooking, you know, whatever happened to be interesting to you. And that was a very informal group. There was no real ritual. You just sat in a circle. Um, the aprons were cool, these green aprons with this like felt trim. Um, and then the the other group that I joined, and this was, um, this was one of the groups that ended up really rubbing me the wrong way later. So there is a specific, there is a uh, Rosicrucian order that is specifically Masonic. Now at this point in time, I had already joined a Rosicrucian group called Amork, which is the big one that most people know about, uh, the ancient mystical order of the Rose Cross. This is like, you just pay your membership fee online, they let anybody in, right? The Masonic Rosicrucians is very, very different than this. So I got tapped and asked if I wanted to join this very quickly, like within two years of being a Mason, and other people have been waiting like seven years. Some people really wanted to join and they wouldn't be allowed in. I didn't know any of that when they asked me to join. And so they said, um, the only thing is that you have to be a Trinitarian Christian to join this. Mm. And by this time I had started converting to Christianity, which is a whole entirely different story, believe it or not, that just feeds into this one. Mm -hmm. And so I was a, a Protestant at this time, but also kind of a Gnostic still, you know, I wasn't, a, I wasn't really a Trinitarian, but I said, yes, because I was like, okay, well, I, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't be a Trinitarian. I just don't. I haven't studied it enough. So I just, I told him, yeah, sure. I'm a Trinitarian Christian. And I said, okay, are you a member of any other Rosicrucian orders? I said, yeah, I'm in Amorc. I said, okay, well, you have to leave Amorc if you want to be in, um, it's called SRICF. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a Latin. It's like Societius Rosicrucianus in Civitatis Federalis. It basically means the Rosicrucian Society in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, SRICF. And so I left Amorc, which was kind of soft and like law of attraction -y anyway. Mm -hmm. and I joined this group thinking, okay, cool, a group of Christians in masonry, you know, because now I've been studying the Bible, going to my Wesleyan Protestant church. It's like, cool, I'm glad to find some of this stuff. And it was the exact opposite of Christianity. So they make you be a Trinitarian Christian to join. And once you're there, it's alchemy, it's it's magic. And I mean, it's not like um, like a soft intro. It's like the actual stuff where they have manuals of like how to do alchemy and salamander spirits and, and like books on all, all this kind of stuff very, very heavy focused on Kabbalah, like operative Kabbalah, not just the study of it as a theory. Hmm. So I was kind of shocked by this. I said, why, why did I have to be a Christian to join this if this is the farthest thing from Christian? And so I remember asking at one point to other guys, I said, do you guys even believe in Christ? Like I believe in Christ at this point. So do you guys really believe in Christ? Because I'm kind of confused. And one of the guys said, yeah, you know, like Christ consciousness, sure. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's not what Christ is though. So, so the, my ties to it were starting to fray. And then eventually um, I had this experience where I started to feel this very heavy, oppressive feeling in the lodge and it started in the York Rite. And I, I couldn't figure out what it was, but it was this very uncomfortable feeling. So eventually I stepped down. I was an officer at the time in the um, Royal Arch, which is one of the uh, bodies. It's the first body of the three in the York Rite. I stepped down, you know, disappointed all my friends. It was hard to do, but I felt relieved. Okay. I don't know why I wasn't supposed to be there, but I feel better now. And then the same feeling kept coming up in every meeting. And eventually I realized God was telling me like, you have to choose, like, do you want masonry or do you want Christianity? So between this feeling and the fact that the Christian group didn't really believe in Jesus, at least not the incarnational sense that Christians do, mm -hmm. all these little things kept showing me, okay, you have to like pick. And then of course there's all the scripture about not uh, having darkness and light yoked together and not having two masters. And it all started becoming very, very clear that these are not compatible and I have to pick one. So I left the lodge completely, uh, even though I had no other real friends at that time. Um, that was my whole social circle. And uh, it was terrifying. 
but I, I felt like I was making the right call. And uh, afterwards, God put it on my heart to write my book on the Masons and their lies uh, to explain to called? other. What's the title? I got it. It's called On the Masons and Their Lies. I got a picture of it right here. So this has been a, a bestseller on Amazon in I think five different categories now, believe it or not, Perfect. which is crazy because when I wrote it, I didn't have a single person in mind. No one was asking me to write it. I just thought this is something like I went through this experience and I feel like God wants me to explain why these two are not compatible because so many guys in masonry are actually Christians and they don't understand why they're not compatible. So I wrote the book, still a Protestant at this time, right? Then I started getting into orthodoxy through another different story that kind of bled into it. Have you heard of and orthodoxy before that? Were you aware of it no, just as another thing? Okay. Not at all. All I knew was there were Christians and Catholics, right? Mm -hmm. Was how I would have worded it, which is how a lot of Protestants describe it, right? They don't consider Catholics to be Christians really. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I started looking to orthodoxy, I decided to rewrite on the Masons in their lies uh, because now I have all these church father quotes, which added like, you know, 50% more evidence to what I was saying, all the things mm -hmm. they were talking about, Gnosticism and all the various things. It really clicked on a deeper level. So then I published it once I got baptized Orthodox. And in a very short amount of time, a priest from New York and the Antiochian Archdiocese reached out to me and said, hey, there was a point in my ministry where every adult man in my parish was a Freemason. Mm. Can you rewrite this book for priests so they can like give it to their, if they have Masonic parishioners? I thought that's a great idea. So I rewrote it again. So on Amazon, it's the second edition, but in reality, it's the third edition because first it was Protestant, then Orthodox, then Orthodox for pastors and priests. Um, so that's the edition that's been out there now. And it's been crazy. The response has been crazy to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I get messages from people every once in a while saying, I left the lodge because of your book, which is the whole point mm -hmm. I wrote it. And, you know, in the Masonic Oaths, it's a lot of like graphic violence and death if you go against them. So I thought there's a possibility of martyrdom if I do this, you know, mm -hmm. but then I thought to myself before I even wrote the book, but if, if I can save one person from the lodge and then I get martyred, that's probably like a golden ticket to have it. You know, that's mm -hmm. not a bad, not a bad arrangement. Right. So I just did it anyway. And in that moment, I overcame my, my fear of death, which I think has served me very well in a lot of other ways too, because yeah. uh, I faced the potential of martyrdom and decided I'm, it's worth the risk. Um, and so I did it and the response has been crazy. Uh, it's got like 60 something reviews on Amazon now with a lot of fake wow. one-star reviews from angry Freemasons who never read the book. And they're just mm -hmm. upset that I did this and Amazon won't take them down, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that was about uh, almost three years ago that I published the book. And since then, after that, I went on Jay Dyer's channel. You know, that was my introduction to the Orthodox internet. And I didn't know at the time how small of a world Orthodoxy was. So all of a sudden people know me and like, I get recognized in church by visitors sometimes, which is super weird, you know? So wait, are you Michael Whitcock? And I say, depends, do you <laughs> like his channel? Um, so it's been a little bit strange getting used to that um, e-celeb thing, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, Is in the Orthodox easy? world, yeah. if you have, what? if you have a channel, everyone recognizes you after a short yeah. while. Yeah. What was it easy for you to write? And have you, were you a writer before or did yeah, it come it to you easy? easy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd written books before um, uh -huh. that are not published anymore because they were, well, one of them, I was really into like the pickup artist world for, yeah. for like 10 years, like similar to Roosh. Mm -hmm. um, I converted a couple years before him, but actually before he shut down return of Kings, I wrote a couple Christian articles for him. Um, so when I had him interviewed on my channel, I said, why did you let me write Christian articles on your fornication website? I was always curious about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd written a book uh, related to that, like dating advice for men, secular dating advice. And I'd started to work on a second one that I decided was too unwholesome. Mm -hmm. uh, even in my degenerate life, I thought, you know, basically teaching people how to like do adultery. Yeah. Uh, and even, even then in my immorality, <laughs> I was like, this is too much. I can't like spread this to other people, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, thank God I didn't put that book out. And then as a Freemason, I wrote a book called, um, oh, what was it called? <clears throat> I don't remember what it was called at this point in time. Cause again, I just woke up. It's been a while mm -hmm. since I've looked at this book. Uh, yeah. I wrote a, a pro Masonry book kind of tying all the, you know, Kabbalah and astrology together and the symbolism and how, it, how Mormonism used the square and compass in their earliest temple garments. Like it was a pro pro occult book basically uh, that reached number two in Gnosticism, believe it or not on Amazon. Uh -huh. So I was used to writing books. Like it's not, there's no anxiety around it for me. Um, it's like, I just, I just put the words on, on the screen and when I'm happy, I publish them. So uh, I'd already gotten through whatever anxiety or fear there might be around having a book by that time. Now that's not the same with fiction, which mm -hmm. I'm interested in, but also kind of terrified of writing because it's so different, but nonfiction for me is, is very, it's like, 
I don't know, working out or taking a walk in terms of like emotional mm-hmm. investment. It's not hard at all. I'm going to go grab a water bottle. Sure, I'll, be, yeah, I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I got one nearby. Yeah, yeah, you're good. My mouth is dry. Uh, it's basically where I am now. And then like I, like I'm, I'm sure you noticed, like I said, I've done a lot of podcasts during Lent, a lot of interviews. So I've, I've shut down a lot of my, you know, secular, I guess, interests that have given me a lot more time to read. I've been reading a lot of uh, books. I just finished this book yesterday that I can't recommend enough to everybody called Two Paths, Orthodoxy and Catholicism Mm -hmm. uh, by Michael Welton. He just published this, but it goes through the history of papal supremacy and papal infallibility. It's not a long book, very easy Mm -hmm. read uh, with canons from the councils, quotes from the church fathers. And it's, uh, it just really exposes the, the fraud that the modern, um, modern interpretation of the papacy is. I mean, it is really nothing like like the ancient world or how they viewed the Pope or the Pope's station. Would you say the Pope was more authentic when the schism happened or when the papacy initially originated? Was there more truth there and it's become more of kind of a faux twisted thing? I would thing? almost say no, because that was part of why the schism happened. Um, like they, you'd had Roman Roman um, patriarchs claiming supremacy before, but no, no one kind of paid attention or believed in it. Um, and he makes, Welton makes an excellent point in this book, which was if the Roman patriarch were the boss of all of Christianity, the Latin speaking Roman patriarch, why would all seven ecumenical councils not only be held in the East, but be held in Greek, a language that the mm-hmm. Pope didn't even speak half the time. Yeah. The Popes were not invited to all the councils. They were not aware of all the councils. One, one of them happened against the Pope's wishes. And the most important thing to me is if, if you could ask an infallible man to infallibly answer a question on faith. Why would you have a council at all instead of just ask the guy? Mm-hmm. What would yeah. be the point? You know, yeah. Why why go through all these years of effort of gathering all the bishops if one of them can speak infallibly ex cathedra? You say, all right, sit on your sit on your chair and tell us the answer to the question. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just a really fascinating book, but yeah, it, it, was, really it, exposes, it have a lot to yeah. do with Peter and his time in Rome yeah. that, that the Pope was. Or I'm not f- familiar with the origin of where the Pope actually kind of originated. It was it yeah. before the schism, right? Uh, this was, they were part well, of the Pope one. was just the patriarch of, of the Roman archdiocese, one of mm-hmm. five sister patriarchs or brothers. I don't know why they're called sisters or brother patriarchs. Um, and yeah, their claim is because uh, Matthew 16, 18, 19, Christ says to Peter, uh, I say that thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So the, so Roman Catholics will claim that Peter, the person of Peter was the rock that Christ was referring to. Most of the church fathers said that the confession of faith was the rock that Christ was referring to, including Western bishops like St. Ambrose of Milan and St. Augustine of Hippo, my patron saint, specifically said Peter, Peter the person, was not the rock Christ was referring to. It's the, the true Christian faith is the rock on which the church is built. Um, and so actually, you know, let me see if I can find, there's a good quote in here that I think is relevant that I should have Could it be both? Um, and that it's not obviously specifically Peter, but, um, you know, he's an instantiation of it, but obviously he's not the rock, but, you know, could it be kind of well, both and that was twisted? Well, here's, here's the short answer to your question. Mm-hmm. I just found a quote. Yep. A much quoted survey compiled by Roman Catholic scholar Jean de Lenoy finds that 17 fathers thought of the rock as Peter, 44 thought it referred to Peter's confession, 16 thought Christ himself was the rock, while eight thought the rock represented all the apostles i.e. 80% of the church fathers did not recognize the person of Peter as the rock. Mm -hmm. So that's the Roman Catholic's entire claim to papal supremacy. Now, there's another problem with that, which was that Peter was not supreme or infallible, Mm -hmm. right? Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, Peter's Judaizing, he's being a heretic, and Paul rebukes him, and then they have a council, right? Peter doesn't claim supremacy and infallibility. They hold a council, all the apostles do, that St. James presides over because it's his, it's his, um, territory in Jerusalem, and the council rules against Peter. So how can you say your Pope is supreme and infallible based on Peter when Peter was not supreme and was fallible? So it's really just a silly when you look at it all in its full historical context between scripture, the church fathers, mm-hmm. the canons, uh, just an excellent book. So I've had a lot of time to read stuff like that and, um, and do podcasts over the last few weeks, and it's been extremely fruitful. And I kind of don't even miss watching the news. Yeah. Um, way I kind of thought I might. Are you doing any fasting for Lent? Oh yeah. No meat. Um, and I, I was going to do no meat and no dairy, like I've done the last two years. Uh, but I asked my priest for a blessing to consume Greek yogurt for the protein. Uh, cause I work out like six days a week. So I don't want to mm-hmm. just have no protein. 
And he said, yes. And also you can eat fish. So I didn't ask, right? No fish, 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 fish. fish. Okay. I didn't ask for that blessing, but he threw it in with the Greek yogurt. So yeah, I've been eating some salmon and stuff like that as well. I can't have sushi because I want to have the sushi with the cream cheese in it. But I'm trying right. to not yeah. to eat dairy and all that stuff. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. I'm, you know, I uh, was Orthodox growing up uh, as a child. My parents were Greek immigrants coming over here. And, oh, okay. Um, I went to church with my yaya, my grandma first 12 years of my life, and then just stopped going and got into, uh, you know, a lot of uh, study philosophy in school, really got into continental philosophy, and then postmodern philosophy pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. um, and then got into Eastern spirituality, uh, Taoism, uh, and traditional Chinese medicine for many years, I practiced kind of healing, uh, mm -hmm. Qigong, uh, internal martial arts, things of that nature. And I'm just getting back into kind of the orthodox ethos the last couple of years. And um, so this Lent, I, I gave up alcohol. So it's been three weeks since I drank alcohol, first time since I was 17 years old. Um, wow. And I'm just starting to do meat, no meat, no dairy on Wednesdays and Fridays. And I'm kind of easing my way back in. Um, and hopefully next Lent, I plan to kind of go full bore. Because uh, this idea of fasting is, it just resonates a lot. I've been the church fathers really um, have brought me into this this prayer rule that I have, and I have a six year old son who is very interested in it. And we pray every morning wow. uh, and every night, and then throughout the day we do the Jesus prayer, and he sort of leads it a lot of times. Um, wow! He memorized the uh, Saint Patrick right there. Right, he memorized Saint Patrick the Saint Patrick breastplate prayer. Right, which wow. uh, he memorized the whole thing before I could because we say it every day, and I'm like, whoa. Cause it's, it's, it's long and it's, yeah you know, it's difficult. So he's kind of helping help drive that as well. But this idea of fasting, I was talking with my wife about it. I'm like, it's not that it's something in specifically in the food or like a vegan is no. against eating meat. It's you're sacrificing something. So yeah. it's not, if you eat something that has meat in it or, or dairy in it, it's not terrible if you didn't know, right. You don't want to do that because you're not being mindful. You're not being aware, but right. it's about sacrificing something. All right. And that what that does for your soul and what that does yeah. for your growth. I think yeah. that's an important distinction rather than the kind of secular vegan fasting type thing, or even the new new kind of intermittent business, high performance type fasting that you see coming up as well. Yeah, no, it's nothing like that. And there's a yeah. I forgot where, where it is in the Bible, but at some point the apostles or some disciples ask Christ, why can't we get rid of these demons? And he says, This kind only goes out by fasting and prayer. Mm. It's not yeah. fasting or prayer. Take your pick. It's fasting and prayer. So I've, I've battled addiction my uh, entire, you know, young adult life. I uh, was addicted to opiates for many years. Uh, uh -huh. Went to kind of a se several different rehabs, court ordered rehabs. Uh, and then I was on this top uh, Suboxone for seven years, which is this like wow. uh, opiate replacement thing, yeah. uh, which didn't get you high, but it kind of lets you get your life together. But it's super hard to kind of stop. Uh, super hard. I'm talking about no sleep for six weeks just feeling absolutely uh, terrible. And I found this substance called Kratom, which uh, helped me tremendously to, to get rid of that. And I still take it. Uh, I still take it daily. Um, mm -hmm. And I just met with an Orthodox priest who's kind of guiding me. Um, and he's like, you know, and I'm like, do I, I need to stop the Kratom now. And he's like, Kratom's medicine for you right now. He's like, don't, you know, don't, you know, he kind of gave me some really, some really great advice that helped me kind of let go of the alcohol um, and allow me to start, start doing the, the fast and whatnot. But this idea that, um, you know, food is the biggest addiction, right? And it feeds the demons. It feeds the, the addiction, the impulse, the passions. Yeah, so I was asking him, I'm like, how am I going to stop eating? Uh, I'm not going to eat meat and dairy, but I'm taking Kratom every day. He's like, no, it's not like that. He's like, if you stop, if you stop eating, if you do the fast, that'll turbocharge your ability to beat the addictions. And it kind of totally. clicked for me. I'm like, oh, wow. It's, it's interesting how that, how that works. Um, but just to get back a little bit to, to Peter. So I started this podcast, um, the Rooster's Crow podcast, and the way it kind of came about is, uh, you know, the story of Peter's denial of Christ in the scriptures. Um, mm. I started a new job back in October and behind the, the new office space, there's a uh, Antioch and uh, St. Elias, a church there. And my son that was just born, his name is Eli, Elijah. And they had a one singular rooster back there. Like I didn't see any other animals and it would crow in the morning when I would go to work and one time I was um, leaving work or I was getting there to work and I heard the rooster crow and it just 15 minutes later, it popped in my head. I'm like, that would be a good idea for a podcast. And the way I thought of, of the rooster crow is, you know, Peter's, I mean, Jesus's closest disciple, right? Because, it, because of the power of the crowd, when he was asked three times uh, and he denied Christ after saying, I will die for you, right? Yeah. He was so captured by the crowd and so uh, that he denied God. 
you know, three times. And then the rooster crowing was this kind of, it was simultaneously the worst day of his life and the best day of his life because it, it called him to repentance, right? Yeah. So the idea is who are the people now? Because uh, who are the people now that are like the rooster's crow, you know, uh, you know, seeing signs of warnings and caution and, hey, look what's happening in the world, but also giving pathways forward to metanoia and to repentance. So that's the the kind of the basis of the people that I reach out to to talk with because cool. they're cool. very looking at what's happening in a very sober way, but they're not despairing. And they're saying that there is a truth and there is truth in the world and here's some pathways forward. And I had a few um, kind of different people on and a big part of my journey back to orthodoxy through um, Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Peugeot played a huge role because he introduced me to the church fathers. And then I started reading the church fathers and that uh, just radically reoriented me. Um, and that's about a year and a half ago. I started praying hard daily uh, and using the prayers of the saints and not doing my own prayers and just the effects it had in my life, like the relationships, the relationship with myself got better, but then with my family. And then I got the job that I kind of fell into, which was great. And I have great relationships with people at work and even with people that I meet, you know, strangers, like the dialogue is not like superficial dialogue. Like we meet at a certain level where there's a genuine connection there. And it's mm. like, I'm not getting more things in my life, but the quality of and the nature of the relationships with other human beings is changing and I can discern that. And I'm like, wow. So it keeps me going in that sense. Um, That's very cool. Now, can I, can I interject for a second? Yeah, yeah, please. So regarding this Kratom thing, um, I mean, it was very popular in the pickup world, believe it or not. I never did hmm. it, but I saw people... There's a guy called Good Looking Loser. This guy named Chris who's always talking about it, people doing it. But so my experience, so I haven't done drugs in like probably five years. Okay. And I used to do drugs every day. What my experience has been was that as you get deeper into orthodoxy and you read more scripture and you pray more and you spend more time in services and you really repent through all, like the deeper you go, the more of your own evil that you see. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but God also gives you more light with which to overcome it. So it's like spiritual weightlifting, the weights get heavier, but your muscles get bigger too. Yeah. Now what I have found, and I think this will be the case for you, if you continue to be disciplined and stick with this, is that eventually, so there's like a, a, like a baseline spiritual level that each person has, like might start down here. Some people might start up here, whatever. Mine was way down here. The, the more you get into it, the deeper you get into it, the more your spiritual level goes up. Now, what happened with me is that it eventually reached a point. So where I, I would start off down and then my prayer would be like up here. Then after prayer would come back, right? And mm -hmm. pray high spiritual level, then back to the world down here. And over time, that kind of default level rises and rises. So instead of, instead of the nice feeling with God being like a departure from normal, eventually that is the normal. And then your departures from God are the abnormal part. Mm -hmm. and once you start getting up here, uh, you don't want to do drugs because the feeling that you have that, that grace from God, that relationship with God is so good and so pure and so powerful and strong and pleasant and all the other good words I can think of that the idea of deliberately getting rid of that by ingesting some intoxicant uh, is the same will feel like uh any other sin to you because you won't want to break what you have with God. Mm -hmm. So as yeah. you go deeper into it, like you'll, that feeling that you get, like the Kratom helps you get through the other addiction stuff. You'll get to a place where sobriety is feels so good that you will have, you will have no interest in drugs. Yeah. Like it's not even a temptation for me anymore. I haven't smoked cigarettes in like eight years, not even a temptation yeah. because God, what God gives you is so much better and you don't have to wreck your body to feel it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably where, where your life's going to go over the next few years. I hope so. Certainly. Yeah. I had, I, I was able to quit Adderall, which I did for, for many years that fell away. And I always had this fear that um, in doing that, I would feel bad, so bad. I just can't do it. Cause I can't be like that at work. And that just didn't happen. Like, and it just fell oh, away. Uh, yeah. You know, and it's, it's, I had this period. So, um, you know, I got, my parents are Greek immigrants and I got into this uh, field that I'm in and and ended up being successful. And I started making like six figures and that was a huge deal to me. I bought a new house and a new a car on the same day. And I was just, I felt so good. I, that's what I was the goal. Right. Uh, but that was like, uh, you know, if, if I found out that that was empty um, mm -hmm. and then when that happened around 2015, my son was born in 2014. I got, first uh, one? I, man, my first one, I, I was dealing with the Adderall addiction, um, you know, and, I went to, I've been to many shrinks and all, you know, different types of things. I went to this yeah. traditional Chinese medicine. I had acupuncture and that sparked something in me. I had a, a mm. tremendous awakening where it was just like, whoa, I felt chi. Like, and I mm. got obsessed with the, what this thing chi is. 
And I researched and I started getting heavily into traditional Chinese medicine. And I found a, a Qigong master who was in our area here. And I studied with him like hardcore daily, weekly uh, for, a, for a good year, maybe more than that. And um, I, I had I stopped eating meat. I just ate kind of uh, for a good six months. I ate like fruits and berries. I lost like 30 pounds. I shaved my head and you know, my poor wife's like, what the heck is happening with this dude? Like I started, yeah. I started getting into psychedelics and talking about how, you know, if everybody did DMT, if the CEOs would do DMT, then the world would just be better off. Right. And God bless her. She's just like from the outside in, it was a, it was a mental breakdown, but for me, I'm becoming spiritually awake, man. I'm ascending. You don't mm -hmm. see what's happening here. The world's ascending. Yeah. And, and, um, and I was able to stop some of the things that I was doing, but I was exchanging those for these spiritual experiences that I was chasing in meditation yeah. or from the psychedelics or whatever it is. And I quit my six figure job to start a meditation and a Qigong business and a healing business uh, called Trinity Energy Works, where I was going to um, open up a business. And it was so impactful in my life, the meditation and uh, the alchemy, the Taoist alchemy that I was doing, like, I'm just going to share this with others. And it's going to have this tremendous effect, tremendous effect. Nobody cared. Like I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not in a community where that, where that would, you know, work. And yeah. I just was spiritually inflated. My ego was inflated. I thought I was doing something to help people, but my relationships were disintegrating. And I had very strange experiences of, of uh, you know, Archangel Metatron coming to me, just dealing with an entities, like yeah. ter terrible things. But at that time, it felt really good. And I felt like, you know, uh, I was, I was gaining the gnosis, uh, but that just inflated the spiritual ego, uh, you know, that popped. And so when you're talking about this idea of of uh, now when you're working with with metanoia and true repentance, it's the opposite of that. You're not inflating the ego, you're deflating it through this prayer and processing in a sense. And that's been the, the biggest shift uh, kind of in my life, because I think to myself now, and this is something I ask people that I interview, you know, uh, David Patrick Harry was really into psychedelics and whatnot. And yeah. I'm very aware of myself. Of how do I know that I'm not just getting into another spiritual uh, ego thing where five years from now, we're not going to look back and be like, God, oh, yeah, it became this uh, Jesus freak. And, uh, you know, how do I know that that's not happening? And I guess I'll ask you the question. How do you know? Because you were really into to, um, uh, to the esoteric, all right, and the masonry. How do you know this is different? So there's a number of ways. The first one is that I feel amazing. I'm like happy all the time with no outer stimulants whatsoever. And I have no desire to do anything, which in and of itself, this is not proof of anything, right? You could say this is a delusion. You could, you could make that argument. But the major difference, or one of the major differences, is how stable my life has become. I mean, I'm a person who has moved, packed up and moved every six months to a year for a long, long time. Constantly having, you know, I was never really into relationships in my, in my 20s, just like flings constantly. Mm -hmm. there's always some drama involved with the breakup there like whether it's a, an argument or bad feelings involved there's always not always but there's often something there and I was I was miserable because I was on drugs I wanted to stop the drugs and I couldn't stop you know I I tried you know like prayer in my own weird new age way did absolutely nothing of course then you just feel bad you know the addict shame is really the root of addiction right and yeah. it's just like the over overarching emotion you're always dwelling in because you you hate the fact that you're addicted to this you feel so weak like you can't stop now, the difference is in Christianity, that's a virtue because when you realize that you're too weak, then you lean on God to do it instead. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to fight it with your own willpower, which is going to fail every single time, even if you manage to be sober by your willpower, you're, you still have all the internal twisting that caused the addiction in the first place. You're just like overpowering it with a Band-Aid instead of mm -hmm. a scrubbing of the wound. In Christianity, it's the opposite because the, the less power you give to yourself, the more healed you get. So the, the deeper you get, the more you realize how weak you are, except, and when you're reading about this as a secular person, like Christians calling themselves weak and all this, you're like, what a bunch of like, you know, you have all these names you, you won't say for them. Mm -hmm. They're these weak men. They can't do anything for themselves. But then if you look at your own life, you're like, well, my, my supposed strength and power has led me to addiction and I'm actually just a slave. So really who's yeah. the weak one here? But I'm reading this book, 30 steps to heaven during Lent. It's like the ladder, uh, the divine ladder of ascent for lay people. Mm -hmm. And, Part of it's about humility, of course, as most Christian books are. And the big difference is that the prog spiritual progress that I have made as a Christian, I don't attribute to myself at all. Mm. Whereas the progress I made in masonry or occult, it's all about you and like how smart you are and how enlightened yeah. you are. Like it's all about you. Whereas Christianity is all about God. Mm -hmm. And so that's a main difference where you don't get to feel as like dominant and powerful and like, you know, superficially alpha or whatever as you might otherwise 
Um, but the result is so night and day and it's so much better. Like yeah. I don't miss, I don't miss my old lifestyle. Like, yeah, I felt like the man all the time, you know, all the time. Yeah. Well, if your girlfriend wanted me, then, you know, I guess you weren't that cool in the first place. Like right. that feeling that I thought was so awesome at the time stops me from having peace and happiness in my life. You yeah. know, stop me from being free of addiction. Yeah. So I would say that's, that's the main difference is that it's not about you at all because God's love is constantly shining at all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. St. Augustine says, God loves you as if you were the only human being on the face of the planet. Yeah. The problem is we have the blinds closed, right? Yeah, so sure. all the prayer, all the repentance, all the, all the uh, metanoia, all that stuff. It's not like we're doing something to earn God's love because God's love is already there. He went to the cross for us. Yeah. All of that is just opening the blinds, right? That's our only role in it is allowing God's love in by getting out of his way. Yeah. So we're not like climbing this ladder, even though we have a ladder to divine ascent and this kind of stuff. We're just taking our own resistance out to what's already there. So the ladder is more inward and upward, mm -hmm. uh, which is very different than anything I experienced uh, in the occult. Yeah, I had um, a very strong experience of that. You could say the lion's opening is when my son was born and the relationship that I have with him and the absolute unconditional love that I have for this child it made me think about well, this is a fraction or a lower dimensional slice of how God loves me. Like, totally. I, like my, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. It's like, uh, and if my son he grew up and he got into drugs or he got into doing stuff and he left and I loved him to death and he left and then he came back years later and he called me and said, dad, I want to, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. I want to come home. Like I would be mm -hmm. open arms, right. Yeah. Just welcoming him home. So I'm thinking if God, if that is the emotion that I feel uh, for my kids, imagine how, if you really believe God, the father and his son, right. Uh, which I do, I think it's more than a belief. Like, you know, I really, uh, I, I really, it's like, you don't believe in it. Do you believe that you were born? You weren't aware that you were born, you know, you're told you have parents and you have parents, yeah. but you know, so it's like, if that, if that little emotion that I have, which is profound for me is, you know, in, in respects to what that relationship is, it's driven me towards, towards that. And the more and more I move towards that, the more and more, I feel things cohering in my life, like mm. relationships with mom and dad, like, like relationships with my wife. I want to you know, do more for her and with my kids and try to be present more. And then at work, instead of always looking for the next high, whether it's buying something or getting a new gadget or sc scrolling through Facebook or whatever it may be, the intensity of that, of being drawn towards that goes lower and lower. Right. And I'm interested in less things, but more, focused on reading the church fathers and, and working on, on kind of my prayer and moving through this kind of orthodox ethos. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I could, I always see this, me saying this, looking at it from, from the outside, it's going to be like, you know, people will not understand it. You have to have the eyes to see if you have the faith and you try it and you start reading the church fathers and you start praying, give it six months, you will see like, you know, yeah, what, totally. what else are you going to do? What else do you have right now? And I think, why do you think right now um, that a lot of people are finding, you know, Sarah, Father Seraphim Rose wrote, wrote the book, Orthodoxy is the Religion of the Future, mm -hmm. which I'm like, whoa, that's an interesting thing to say because it's this most archaic, you know, uh, you know, incense, robes, rules, closed off, you know, uh, type of religion. It's the religion of the future. And now we're seeing this community, different communities popping up of people going, moving towards Orthodoxy. Why do you think this is happening right now? Well, I think that the worse the world gets, the less uh, investment people are going to put into it. Like when they see how transient and uh, temporary everything is, like, like look at our country on the grand scope of things, right? Everyone likes to talk about it. it's the greatest country in the world, blah, blah, blah. But really, if you look at the big picture, this was an experiment that barely lasted 200 years before it fell apart, right? So, and this was a country that was at the top of the world 70 years ago, right? Like the top peak 70 years time frame from peak to clown world, which is where it's at right now. So I think that if you had your faith in politics or in politicians or in the economy or in, you know, uh, pride in your nation, like anything that's not God and you, all of that's taken away from you. Well, you have two choices. You can either be suicidally depressed because everything that's important is gone, or you can find something that actually is permanent to put your faith in instead. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in his book, City of God, uh, St. Augustine, in the, the first few books, spends a lot of time talking about this, about how what looks on the outside like suffering and falling apart and disaster is not 
perceived that way to a faithful Christian, where the same, the same event that could cause a non-Christian to suffer might chastise and chasten and edify a Christian. Mm -hmm. So in a large scale, you know, I'm not even upset about America falling apart because we kind of deserve it, frankly. And I think this is God's way of showing you this is what happens when you dwell in sin. You know, what's happening to America is the same thing that happens to you as an individual. Okay. On the, on the political side, you have the corruption, the drag queen story hour, the promotion of gay marriage, all this stuff that God clearly says he's not a fan of, right? You do that stuff, you get punished. Mm -hmm. So if you have the eyes to see, like you were saying a second ago, you say, okay, well, if this is what happens to people, communities, churches, countries that depart from God's way, you know, the whole Old Testament is about what happens to a group that departs from God's way. Yeah. But for some reason, people, you know, just don't get it until it's right in front of them. Yeah. Um, so I think people are coming back because they start looking for something that is uh, more eternal. And then they look at the Bible and they say, oh, everything that's happening was explained here already. Maybe there's yeah. some truth to this. Yeah. Uh, I sure. know then for people like me and Roosh who spent so long uh, just in hedonism and realizing what an empty hole that is. Like you reach the end of that where you've spent all this time trying to pick up women and succeeding at picking up women. And you have this lifestyle that most guys are so jealous of, but you're miserable and empty inside. Well, you realize, okay, so pleasure is not something worth seeking after. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is again, something that, I mean, there's no conversation we're having today that didn't take place 2000 years ago, right? Really on any topic. So even yeah. back in, in the early Roman empire days, you had Christians against the pagan philosophers, right? Some of whom like the Epicureans, did believe in just making pleasure uh, happen as much as possible and for as long as possible, that was their worldview. Mm -hmm. So people still do that. They don't have the name Epicurus for it or Epicurean, but all of the different lifestyles and perspectives and paradigms that people can have towards life in the world have already been explored completely. Yeah. All the yeah. questions have been answered. There is no new question. Nothing new is coming up that's never come up yeah. before. Maybe in certain like specific things like transhumanism that the ancient church fathers couldn't have really perceived, like adding robot parts to yourself. But even that, you know, there's some analogous thing that they talked about back then. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, just, I think that when you see where where the temporary leads, you have no choice but to turn to the eternal. Ideally, yeah, if you're, if yeah. you're a man that pays attention or a woman paying attention. Definitely, that's beautifully said. And I was I had a I kind of did the first live stream the other day, and this came to me. It's like we're seeing the institutions that we've been relying on for so long globally and in our country just disintegrate in, in front yeah. of our eyes. And you can either look at the falling pieces or you look at you can look at the light shining through that's actually disintegrating the structures. Exactly. Right? COVID is, is like a, a kind of baptism by fire, right? And the way that yeah. a virus spreads, there's something to that. So what we're seeing, if we look at, if we're looking down, we don't believe in the transcendent, it's just destruction. But if you look, the new is just pushing through and it's just yeah. about cultivating the, the heart to, to in the eyes to see that. And I think many people are, are moving towards that. And I think why cha channels like yourselves and, and Jonathan Peugeot and David Patrick Perry, there's the population of Orthodox in the United States is 1%. And these channels are growing, what, from 1% of the population? It, it's a global thing because people are moving towards this, this archaic thing because it's talking, it's talking about the truth. And it, like you said, nothing new under the sun. You see the most scientific you know, um, materialist scientist, he's telling us now, essentially repent, your behavior is causing the flood to come. Global warming, mm -hmm. climate change is happening because of human behavior. How are you not saying that because of your sins, the flood is coming, right? Yeah. It's like, and they don't see that. It's like, it's so close, but so far that? away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. And this idea of sin and, and thinking of sin, the Greek word is amartia, which comes from archery, which means to miss the mark. My whole yeah. entire life, and when you say somebody, your sins are causing the destruction in yourself and in your family. And if you continue, it will disintegrate your, your life. If you do that as collectively as a body, as a nation, if you sin for a long time, guess what? Decoherence and disintegration. Yep. But what do you mean by sin? You're just a sick person. You know, the, the atheist would say, I'm uh, Christopher Hitchens. You're born sick and ordered well. What kind of God would uh, you know, make you be born sick and ordered well? Well, that's not what sin means. Sin means that, that you're missing the mark, is that you're not aiming appropriately and and what you're doing is is disintegrating your life for for a reason, right? And that's the, it gave me an ability to look at the Ten Commandments with new eyes. Like these are the mm -hmm. base codes. Like if you just do these things, you can build, you know, and love your neighbor, you know, love God with all your heart, right? Connect yourself to the infinite. If you connect yourself to anything else, it crumbles, right? Every every ideology becomes 
an idol idolatry. And I yeah. think you're seeing all of these structures fall and people have their hooks into these structures, their identities into these structures. And as they're falling, their identities are falling. So they're just throwing Hail Marys in a sense, right? It's like, God said, have no God before me, right? He says yeah. that, you know, plug into the mystery, plug into the infinite, right? And then love your neighbor with what you get from that as yourself. Do those two things and then follow these basic rules. Don't lie. Don't be jealous of your neighbor's things. Uh, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. Uh, you know, the Ten Commandments, these are the base rules. If you follow these rules, right, the relationships that you have in your family and in communities and in a broader sense will work out where you're going to have a coherent, well, you're going to have well-being. These are the rules for the kingdom of heaven. And I used yeah. to look at these like, are these Ten Commandments, these are just archaic rules to scare kids, but it's, mm. it's the exact opposite. And yeah. we fail, and I fail at following those rules every day. And failing at following those rules is sin. Because yeah. you don't want to lie, but you lie, right? Become aware of it and and have a change, metanoia, right? Repent and whatnot. So that that difference, that understanding sin as missing the mark and not as some kind of inherent sickness that you have that makes you a bad person, right? Is you have the ability to to have a change of heart, to have a metanoia, and I think that is this this is coming. This idea is becoming more in, ingrained in people's hearts, and they're doing what they can to kind of make a make a shift in the middle of what we see coming through our televisions. Like uh, I have this idea that, that what we see coming through Twitter and what we see on social media is not real. It's not no. real. That's why I'm not on Facebook or Twitter anymore. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's so hard. Cause I still, you know, I'll engage with it. And then I'm like, when I unplug and I look around and my wife and my kids and good, the good relationships that I have, and I don't see this kind of degeneracy at, in my community. I know that it's, it's elsewhere but it's not real. It's hyper real. It's kind of this fake reality. And through Twitter, now it's spilling into the real world. So it's like, mm. how do you navigate that where it's like, hey, if you pay attention to it, you get pulled into the insanity, whether you're for it or against it, but you can't just, you can't just unplug from it completely. So how do you thread that needle? You think? I think you can unplug from it pretty completely. Yeah. Well, like the I mean, homesteading, being, you know, homesteading, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. that, that thing. I don't obviously know that that's that, the solution. You know, that I don't or know. being a monk would be the full retreat from the world. But I'll tell yeah. you that, I mean, I haven't been on Twitter in years. I haven't been on Facebook in a long time. Uh, it has not hindered my progress in life in any way, shape, or form. I don't feel like I'm missing anything by not taking part of this just anger-fueled nonsense and chaos on there. Um I'm tr I mean, I've only not been looking at the news for about three weeks, so we'll see if I stick with that or not. I mean, especially if you have a family and kids, you do have to know to some extent what's going on in your yeah. immediate area, right? But maybe not national news. And I was thinking just the other day, how much happier must ancient people have been when they didn't know uh, what all the problems were on the other side of the world, much less that they were being blamed for all of them, like you know we are in America now. Yeah, Marshall McLuhan, uh, the, the, media, the media studies guy, he said this controversial, um, you know, Marshall McLuhan, you ever heard of him? No. Mm -hmm. He's a media studies, a Canadian uh, kind of media studies superstar. He was around in the 50s, 60s. He wrote a book uh, called Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man. He has this mm -hmm. saying, the medium is the message. Um, oh, I've heard that part before. Yeah. And he, he was saying that, um, he said that he talks about how you know, technology, the new technologies in frame our world and that in framing becomes, it recedes into the background and we pay attention to the content. So uh, the television program is less important than the way television reorganizes society, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the car, the automobile, the specific automobile is, more, is less important than the way roads and highways reorganize the way our communities are situated against each other, sure, right? Same thing sure. with social media in a sense. So the medium and the message, the medium is the message means that, uh, that, that which affects us recedes into the background with the, the, uh, adoption of a new technology, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and he explored these, these media landscapes is more like, it's like a media ecology. And he was very well read. He was an expert in Finnegan's wake, very well read. And he was a, a devout Catholic and, um, he he actually uh, he said that the um, I forgot what the, what the point was there what what, uh, what he kind of uh, he said that yeah Christ is the medium in the message so Christ is that one thing that that combines the two in a sense um, and he said that um, uh, I forgot what my point was going to be there maybe it'll come back to me um, but this idea that that uh, the technologies that that we use in a sense they're they're they are degrading our relationships and they're and they're changing the way that we relate to each other. And is there a way to reverse engineer them? Is there a way to reverse engineer the algorithm for good? I guess the question is, is that Honestly, possible? Not with the people in charge that are in charge right now. Uh, what I've found is that 
local community is way more important than social media. Uh, I still have like Facebook messenger to get in touch with certain people, but I mean, I kind of just hang out with my own parish members at this point in time, almost exclusively. Uh, most, if not, yeah, I would say 99% of my secular friends are just no longer part of my life mm-hmm. for various reasons. You know, not that I was happy about seeing them go at certain points, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's about our salvation, right? It's not about how much you know about what's going on. It's not about technology. It's not about politics because there's never been a situation uh, a political situation that stopped people from being saved. There's never been a amount of technology or lack thereof that stopped people from being saved, right? Because God is there the whole time, regardless of the outer forms of what's going on around you. So I just try not to put too much investment into those little temporary things, you know, like and it's, it's hard to avoid. Sure. Uh, especially if you have nothing else going on. Like if you don't have God in your life, why not be on social media? Why not be arguing with people? And I still argue with people on Gab a little bit mostly just calling out uh, heresies, which there are so many, because there's so many Protestants on there and, you know, God bless them. And um, I know that they mean well, they're following Christ the way that they think is the best. They've just some combination of being misled and being historically ignorant has uh, they're just new heresies every day on Gab. You see, I mean, not new ones, ones that were dealt with 1500 years ago, but new, new to them. Yeah. So I just try my best to surround myself with the right kind of person you know, there's no benefit to surrounding yourself with the wrong kind of person. Um, like why there's no reason for me to hang out with my old Mason friends. Uh, occasionally I do, but for the purpose of trying to convert them, you know, one of them has become a Christian. He's not Orthodox yet, but he's at least in the right direction. You know, got mm-hmm. baptized. Uh, another one I always hoping will become Christian, but there's no reason to hang out with, with people that are only going to drag you backwards. And there's no reason to engage with technology that pr- brings you spiritually backwards either. Mm-hmm. So could it be a force of good? Probably not because it was invented as surveillance in the first place. Um, yeah. You know, none of this is organic. I mean, Gab is organic, I think, but Facebook certainly was was a yeah. Pentagon project called Life Log before they mm-hmm. rebranded as Facebook. Hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't know um, that. Oh yeah, if you actually look at it, the Pentagon had a uh, global surveillance project called Life Log that they officially shut down the same week that Facebook launched. That just so happened to use all the same technology. Oh. Yeah, that, that, well, think about this. Do you have to surveil someone when they're uploading pictures of themselves, tagging their exact location all day? Why are they surveilling us? What's the point of this? Well, that's the goal of the uh, oligarch class is complete control uh, over every citizen's behavior and thoughts if they can get away with it. There's this idea, you know, through Operation Paperclip and this idea that the, the Nazis never really came out of power. That it was just transformed and morphed into what now is the national security state, which kind of sounds crazy. But well, we, we brought some of them over here after we beat them in the war, yeah, and they became part of our infrastructure. Yeah. NASA, for example, started by uh, Werner von Braun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those, those things are true. Like that happened. But do you think that that moves towards that the same kind of ideology in a sense has, has morphed and the power really hasn't changed. It's changed its form. And now it's becoming more obvious because, you know, they're leveraging these technologies on us and with Snowden and whatnot, it's just apparent what's happening and they don't care that it's apparent. It's like, so what if you know, so what if yeah. there's a, a, so what if there's riots every day in your street? So what if the, the, there's a capital riot and we call it insurrection, which is bull crap. What are you going to do about it? So yeah. What are you, you going to do? We you can't know? do anything. And they, they get off on that. They know, uh, they, they know that. I mean, that the game used to be denying anything was happening and now it's more like rubbing it in your face because, because, because they can. Yeah. You know, that's always, always been the goal of the evil one because it is all spiritual warfare, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the force of corruption, the, the lust for control and dominance, that's always been around. And that spirit doesn't go away just because one form of government falls. It just, you know, moves to another group of people or to another person. That part never goes away, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, you could kill all your enemies you could wipe, wipe the whole earth clean of all the people you hate. And the next day, they would be just as many evil murderers and corrupt people. And because yeah. it's the spirit, you can't kill the spirit part, right? The body is just the vessel for the, for the spiritual darkness. Um, but so yeah, we're, you, we're in a situation yeah. now that America is going downhill very quickly. You know, you still have your, uh, the legion of MAGA boomers that think that Trump's going to become president again any day now and turn, fight the deep. I mean, I understand why they believe that it's because they need to have something to hold on to. You know, they're mm-hmm. trying not to collapse into depression. So I understand where they're coming from, but they got to put their trust in God instead of in secular politics or else they're just going to continue. I mean, that bubble is going to pop for them eventually, right? Because it's an idol. It's idolatry. Of course, I mean, there'll be some of these guys will be marched off to the gulags thinking any day now, you know, this is all 4d chess. Trump really set up these gulags and this is all just for show. You know, he was going to say it was any day. Some of them <laughs> will hold on to that delusion until the day they die. I'm sure. 
Yeah. Uh, but six months into the gulag, six months in, they're like, this is it. It's this week. It's all yeah. changing. <laughs> They've lost weight exactly. and uh, they see their buddies you don't die. understand. And... Trump had to let us die in gulags or else <laughs> the bad guys would say he was evil. It's all part of the Goodness. plan. Trust the plan. Yeah. It's absurd. Yeah. He's uh, uh, I was just on Ray yeah. Xperum's uh, D Live channel, uh, Patriot Soapbox, which mm -hmm. is a big Q channel, apparently. And man, her chat turned against me so hard when I started talking about Trump and Q. And they were like, well, who is this guy? He's a psyop. He's a disinformation agent. He's a shill. I was like, I'm just telling you guys the truth. Like, I, but, I was I was on the Trump train as much as anyone. But then once yeah. you see how it goes, okay, well, I believe in something. It turned out to be false. I have to move on to something else. You know, I'm not yeah. going to hold on to it, even when it's been proven false to me. Is it, so the Q stuff is still alive? It's there's oh, still yeah. really. Oh yeah. yeah. I didn't know yeah. it was still kind of going full bore. I had oh, a couple of buddies that, that really got into that and were like, wait, what happened? What's going to happen uh, during the uh, inauguration? Just wait. And I'm like, whoa, this yeah. guy I know really well. Um, and then right after that happened, he, uh, you know, he's like, oh, I'm bipolar and, and, you know, something like that. But I don't know what, what was going on there. But do you think that Q initially was something real and then it was so co-opted by the, you know, co-opted to make people think that, you know, Trump is saving us from pedophiles and whatnot? Do you think in its origins, it was something more uh, real? I, I think so. This opinion is subject to change as more information comes out because I've changed my opinion about Q several times. You know, I was mm -hmm. very uh, cautiously optimistic for a long time. I really wanted Q to be real. Mm -hmm. My opinion at this point is that Q was who he said he was in part, meaning a close insider in the Trump administration, someone that worked directly with Trump constantly but was part of a bigger PSYOP meant to uh, get dissidents to identify themselves and convince them to do nothing while the deep state took over every pillar of power. Yeah. So he was partially, that's how these PSYOPs work, right? They have to mix some truth with that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but in the 1920s in Russia, do you know what Operation Trust? Have you seen this? Um, it sounds, it sounds familiar, but. So but... Operation Trust was a Bolshevik program. This oh, is public yeah. information. Yeah. Uh, where they told all the anti-communists, don't worry, the good guys are secretly in all the halls of power, highest levels of military and government. Trust the plan, wait for the right moment. We're going to take over the communists and we're going to put the monarchy back in, back in power. Yeah. Same exact thing they're doing right now. Yeah. So you see how it worked out both times. It looks to me like they just did Operation Trust again um, because people never lost trust in Q, even when he kept being wrong, right? Trust Barr, trust Ray, trust Sessions. All the people who kept saying the trust failed or were outright yeah. subversive like Bill Barr was. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, Trump is one of the best marketers on the planet. Mm -hmm. But as with many marketers, the substance does not match the packaging. And I think that he got, I think that in his mind, he thought that his skill at business negotiation was gonna transfer to political negotiation when in reality, he got outplayed every single step of the way uh, because he was walking into a game that other people have been playing for centuries that he was brand new to. And he's a very poor judge of character. So the people that he chose to fight on his behalf, half the time were working against him. Yeah. And he lacked the discernment to realize that. And then he let his daughter and her husband run everything anyway, because he had the little like daughter, daughter, daddy issue going on. Yeah. So I don't know whether he meant well or not anymore, but I think that Q was uh, a subverter from the beginning who yeah. played his role. I mean, I, I admire the skill with which the deep state gets what it wants. Like right. when they can trick so many people, like there's, there's something to that. Like, obviously it's evil because of the purpose they're using it for. But it's almost like watching this like symphony of subversion. Like every yeah. little part works with every other part. There's something like the the mechanical side of it is is interesting to look at. You know, yeah, how yeah. dialed in these people are. So yeah, I, I can't say I admire it, but I kind of do, not in its intentions, but in the way that it works. Like I wish yeah. the good guys had something like that. You know, but right. we have nothing even close. Yeah, I mean the good guys are they're just portrayed. They're not, it's not, a, it's like the movies have become reality. Like news organizations don't, don't exist anymore. No, like this idea no. of kayfabe from wrestling has, you know, have you, are you familiar with kayfabe? No. It's like, you know, wrestling in the nineties. Yeah. But most people, some people thought it was real. You know, most mm -hmm. people knew it was fake and the wrestlers would have, uh, you know, works and shoots. Uh, um, a work is when you're, you know, being completely fake. A shoot is when you're kind of really you know, uh, upset at someone, right? And this whole of not knowing if it's real or not that wrestling was, right? They kind of played with that. Uh, Vince McMahon was brilliant at that. And oh yeah, uh, and um, and Trump is part of the WWE Hall of Fame. 
right? Politics has become kayfabe. It's become this thing that, you know, you are fake news. And CNN would try to catch Trump in a lie and, and, and quote him on a lie. And then he would call him fake news. And it's like, no, it's not real. Like, that's mm -hmm. not real what's going on. They're doing what re wrestling's, pro wrestling was doing. And everything has pudding. become this, this wink, wink nod where, and, it, and I think it, it eases some of the cognitive resonance of people because they know it's not real where it's like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't worry. Yeah, they're it's, all, it's, they're all friends at the end of the day. Yeah, especially really? CNN's Jeff Jeff Zucker gave uh, uh, Trump his big shot with uh, The Apprentice. They're really good friends. And they made a lot was of money together. CNN, the Apprentice? Yeah, no, he was he was the uh, um, president of ABC or wherever it was before. Oh, interesting. And then he moved to CNN, and now they're you know they had this whole this whole thing. But uh, all of the, I mean, it's you know, all of, you know things that were hidden are now being revealed. You know, yeah. and it and it is what it is. And I think when, when we get sucked into it, we're getting we're getting stuck into the madness. So kind of pulling away is, is the, I agree with you. Um, but what is your, are you intentions to maybe look at monkhood or enter the priesthood or anything like that? Well, I, I have a girlfriend at the moment and um, you know, we've been talking about potential marriage and what a life together would look like all those conversations. Um, I was not looking for a relationship. I was not looking for marriage when that happened. You know, I was very committed to the single life, whether that was monasticism mm -hmm. or something else. Um, I don't, I don't, the answer is I don't know. Um, it's, it's only been a few months that we've been dating. Um, so there's a lot to figure out and pray through and think through. Um, I mean, I, I never saw myself getting married at any point in my life. It was never a desire I had, but if you have at the same time, if there's someone there that you get along really well with, that you communicate really well with, that would fit well, you would fit well into each other's lives. You know, that's, that's a difficult thing to say no to at the same time. Well, you didn't think you were going to be Orthodox your entire life, you know? Also true. Right. If you told me I was going to be a Christian at all, you know, eight <laughs> years ago, I would have laughed at you. Yeah, me too. So, man. Me too. I don't know. It feels like God is pulling me towards, towards marriage, like kicking and screaming, but I don't know. And I'm, I'm trying very hard to be, uh, she's, she's probably listening to this conversation, ironically. Yeah. She watches most of my videos. Um, Where'd you meet her? If you don't mind asking. At church. At church. Oh, nice. Yeah. There you go. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to not make any decisions emotionally i'm trying yeah. to be logical and rational and think through like you know what would it mean what would i gain what would i lose what possibilities would be cut off and trying to be rational about it but i mean it's going it's going well so far um, yeah. or what do i have to offer her you yeah know? well i i see i i understand why the church teaches marriage and monasticism as the only two valid paths mm -hmm. to uh to holiness essentially yeah like i i get it because being in this relationship for a few months stuff has been brought up like wounds and flaws have been brought up in me that i would not have seen if i'd just been hanging out in my room you know, working mm -hmm. out playing video games or whatever so you can't heal the stuff you can't see um so i see how god is using both her and i as kind of mirrors for each other's you know stuff that you got to work on wonderful and and i'll say that um the communication is very very important to me Mm -hmm. And so she and I, um, through like difficult conversations, have maintained respect for each other and being polite. There's been no raised voices or cursing or name calling, nothing like that. And that is something special for sure to be yeah. able to communicate with someone like that. Very cool. So I'm not jumping into anything like this week or next week. Um, and I thought that I was completely over my lust. So monasticism was looking like an interesting prospect. But then when you're actually dating someone and spending time with them, like, you know, all these are just come back. Right. Know, more, more time spent on someone. So I'm, I'm not as passion free as I believed I was a few months ago. Well, those, those urges aren't inherently bad, right? No, you're, no, like no. sex isn't inherently bad, but the inflaming of like a lot of passions turn out as, as, as positives, right? But then they get inflamed by the, uh, you know, by the demons, right? And yeah. the good thing turns to be a bad thing really quick. You yeah. know, so it's uh, even in marriage, they say that, uh, you know, as the, the marriage spiritually grows, you know, intercourse becomes less important and it becomes more mm -hmm. of this kind of union towards God, right? I, I really believe you become one body. That's not a metaphor. Yeah. You know, when you, when you get married under the church, you literally become, you up level uh, your being in a sense. And, and this weird idea of like, you know, a hydrogen and an oxygen molecule are totally different things, right? And when they come together, they form water, right? They can yeah. never, it's in higher, it's up levels your being. And I think as, this just kind of came to me. If you're a monk, you're focusing on love God with all your heart, right? That is your path. Also love your neighbor as yourself. But as you're married, you're focusing on love your neighbor as yourself, which is your wife, but you're also appointed towards God, right? So the monk yeah. is, is geared more towards 
looking up and in the marriage life you're geared towards the other but both of them yeah. include the both you know what i'm saying well there's, so there's like a there's a spiritual pro and con to each path this is kind of what i've been meditating on so like i really want to see the uncreated light and have these kind of like holy gifts of like clairvoyance and prophecy like i, I want the higher stuff that the monastic mm -hmm. saints have right but i also kind of want to be a dad Mm -hmm. and experience like what we were talking about earlier where your understanding of how god relates to humans is so amplified by your love for your child mm -hmm. which the monks don't get and at the same yeah. time i don't see a lot of married guys having these like higher spiritual gifts that the monks get so it yeah. really is like a it's a tough choice yeah it's a tough choice and i i i know that i'm not cut out to be completely alone forever because i thought i was for a long time and then i remember i visited uh idaho uh, last year or the year before, just because I thought it was a cool place to go visit. I went there for a week by myself. I had a great time, but I drove out like two hours to go to the top of this mountain at one point, just to be completely alone. I got to the top of the mountain and I looked around and I thought, this isn't for me to just be with no one else around. Like I thought would be really great. Mm -hmm. um, but I know I'm not ready for excuse me, either commitment yet. You know, I'm, I'm going to turn uh, 34 in a few months here. Um, yeah. I'm not in a super hurry, but I've never been around children until I got became Orthodox either. Not really. And like, I do, I do like, you know, teasing the kids and playing with them and stuff like that. Making yeah. fun of them sometimes is pretty fun too. When they can take it, you know, you don't want to make fun of the wrong one and like yeah. break their spirit at a young age. Right. Some of them yeah. can take it though. <laughs> I just like to roast people. So you gotta, yeah. you gotta pick the ones properly. Um, yeah. The kids are, you know, Christ said, follow the babes, you know, follow the kids. And he said that, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like, like children are right. They have this, yeah. they have this wonder, like this, this wonder of the world and they enjoy God, you know, God expresses himself through scripture and through nature. And they seem to be really attuned to the uh, God expressing himself through nature. And we kind of just shovel that out of them through teenagers. And I, I mm. kind of see the, the uh, fall being instantiated through puberty in a sense, right? You have this state of innocence, not knowing the yeah. knowledge of good and evil. And then if you get a taste of the knowledge of good and evil, let's say you're six, seven years old and you're on an iPad that's unlocked and you go to some crazy porn site and you see some disgusting, crazy porn, right? Your consciousness isn't ready for that, right? It just mm. shocks you and it, it ruins your life. It could ruin your yeah. life for a long time, right? So it's like, they don't, they don't, they're not ready with spiritually mature enough for the knowledge of good and evil, just like Adam and Eve weren't right. They were, mm. they, they, their dispensation was to eat from the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when they ate from the tree of life first, right? All they had to do was spiritually mature, follow God. And they fell. I see this coming into teenage and adulthood is our fall, right? Because we mm. become grossly aware of the knowledge of good and evil of yeah. how crazy and shitty the world is. So that's what I kind of see this idea of Christ saying, look at the babes, follow the kids because they are in a sense in a more uh, they have more fidelity to the message of Christ than any adult, no matter how much wisdom they have in a sense. Uh, so yeah, yeah I, that's I love a good kids. point. Yeah. And they're not interested in sin either. Yeah. Like, like the idea of like boys and girls is like, ew, gross. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. what a, what a pure point of view. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. My, uh, my six year old said to me, he's like, you know, his best friend came up to him and says, Hey, I blush every time uh, Susie comes near me. Uh, I blush. And he's like, comes to me he's like dad well what's blushing it's like oh mm -hmm. he just you know he gets nervous when she comes around and he told me that this girl uh, madeline wants to marry him and uh <laughs> he's like uh and then she came and kissed me bobby and and frank she, she tried to kiss us all it's so weird i'm like um uh, and right you know my best friend has a crush on this girl my other friend i'm like how about you he's like no i don't at all i'm like good stick with awesome. that yeah. stick <laughs> with that okay you got plenty of time um so I don't know, I guess, you know what, we never even got into it, and I guess we don't have to because, uh, you know, the Jonathan Peugeot, um, Jordan Peterson uh, talk, I think that's kind of when I, I reached out to you. And maybe we can close out with that. Oh, after I did my review of it? Yeah, uh, okay. I saw your first review of it, and um, I saw that you watched the first 50 minutes, and you start talking about it, and I'm like, no, no, you got to watch the rest of it. And then I saw you, because I was a little frustrated because Peterson was just going, and I've heard it through his past and what happened and the difficulties of his life, which is, you know, uh, whatever, it's tremendous what's happening, but I heard it and I'm like, you know, kind of get into it. And then the second half of it, the way that Jonathan handed it, and I'm, uh, you know, part of the symbolic world group. So I'm biased towards him, you know, I'll tell you up front, but the way that he handled it, like, uh, was, uh, was very beautiful for me. And then I'm like very meaningful. And my wife who's not into this stuff at all could care less. I had her watch it and it kind of touched her as well. 
Is your wife uh, Orthodox? Mm -mm. Well, yeah, Uh now she's in the process of of becoming Orthodox, Um, but, but, you know, she's not into these kind of intellectual philosophical conversations, debates at all. All right. So her watching that, I think it, it kind of affected her as well and watching him cry and break down. And I've heard from a lot of critiques that, oh, he should have, you know, like hit him over the head with Orthodox apologetics right then. And he had his chance. And I'm like, wow, my intuition is the exact opposite. Like, because Peterson is this, you know, very intellectually apt guy. So like, you're not going to talk him into it, like intellectually. And I think he just sat with him and like connected it with him with his noose, in a sense, like noose to noose, and allowed him to vulnerably break down and like like you mentioned at the end of your second half of your video he said he said i'm a very confused man and it's like you're in a good place then you're confused with all that knowledge that you have good keep going you know so i, I felt that 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 resonated with me yeah i mean i when i got done with that first video first of all i i realized i had been pretty uncharitable and i was trying so hard not to be so i felt kind of bad about that and a lot of people were saying, no, you have to go watch the second half before you can judge it. And it was, like a, it was very different in the first half. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought Peugeot did a good job explaining the orthodox position. Um, but the approach he takes to trying to convert Peterson is not the approach that I would take. Um, mm-hmm. I think my approach would be more effective. And I tried to, you know, do my approach uh, through Peugeot. You, you've seen that whole, you know, the mm-hmm. whole drama, the whole, <laughs> the whole yeah. back story there. Still waiting to hear back from John about the uh, charity boxing match he hasn't yeah. hasn't gone back yet <laughs> um yeah i mean sometimes sometimes you have to force people to be real with themselves instead of just being gentle about it i mean the bible even says that some people you have to save by with fear pulling them out of the fire paul says yeah yeah sometimes you got to say to people look you just admitted you're the most confused person you've ever met and you're still reading the same stuff that led you there why not try this like the the experiment that I proposed, I still believe in say, why don't you try to be, try Christianity for six months, Christianity mm-hmm. for six months. And if you don't like it, you can go back to being confused and miserable. No one's going to stop you, but why not see if it makes a difference? Yeah. You know, I, I, but I'm also trained in like NLP and persuasion. You know, I was a professional copywriter for a while. So I have training in like how to hit people's buttons in a way that John doesn't because he's a, an artist. Yeah. So the approach would be, would be different. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think this speaks to this kind of not a divide. And I don't think it's a bad thing. This tension between kind of the Orthodox bro community and like the symbolic world community. And it's like, uh, I I don't see it as a a divide. I see it as a two important aspects of what's happening. Like Jay Dyer, I really appreciate his work and I resonate with it because of my background in philosophy and whatnot. Uh, But Jonathan Peugeot, when I found him in the the idea of symbolism, the way that he puts forth in, in the art, like spoke to me in a different way that I never experienced before. But I see both both of them is really important and significant in what's happening. And I think the, uh, the, the I guess the tension between the two is important too, right? The tension mm-hmm. is leading towards a, a bigger, a, a higher unity, I think. So I think I see myself as kind of a bridge between the two in a sense, um, because I think both are important and significant in terms of, of what's happening now. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we need to find I think, an ark, right? Noah's ark was a boat, but in that time, the technology that they had was wood, Right, and they built the this piece of space time to, to to gather and move people towards the the new, right? And then uh, I talked with Jonathan, and I'm like, "What is our current arc? What does an art look like in our modern times?" And he brought up like Dante's comedy was an arc, right? So we can't think of an arc as some kind of just physical thing, and maybe what's being built now through these networks, these um, these um, enriching networks that are happening through Orthodox communities, maybe that's using the technology of the day to build some sort of arc that's going to get us through the coming, you know, collapse, which is obviously happening. So I hope um, so. I I mean, I'm, I'm trying to save all my videos in case, you know, for the inevitable time when Christians are banned from the internet, you know, banned from yeah. YouTube. And I actually have to go do another round of saving videos now that I mention it. Cause I've done yeah. a lot of live streams. Uh, yeah. You gotta get special programs to download your own videos, which is dumb. Like, why can't I just download my own live stream? You know? Right. Yeah. But that's how yeah, YouTube man. works for some reason. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm open to talking with John in the video. I think that would be interesting. You know, he invited mm-hmm. me on his channel and then rescinded the invitation after I accepted, which I thought was unfortunate. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our drama started because he made a video about me. Uh, that was where it started. I didn't go first. Mm-hmm. But I would be happy to, you know, hash it all out. You know, sometimes the way that men become friends is they, they just beat each other up verbally or otherwise, get it all out, you know, and then afterwards you're cool and there's no more drama or tension there. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. You know, if you yeah, want to yeah. be the, the messenger between the worlds, the, the Orthodox Hermes, so to speak. Yeah. 
I don't yeah. know. I'm not going to put that on you, but no, I mean, I'd love to, I'm, I'm still waiting for him to go on Jane Dyer. I know they were supposed to have a, a debate and I'm, like, I think it's this, like, I was kind of hesitant uh, to kind of reach out to you because it, you know, you, you debate and you're pretty good at debating. Like, you know, you, I saw you with that uh, proprietarian guy. What was his name? Man? That, <laughs> that dude. And I'm like, dude, this yeah. guy's going to get his, you know, focus on me, but uh, I don't, I don't see that at all, man. And I, and I appreciate you a lot and, and enjoyed this conversation a whole lot as well. Well, sure. my, my purpose with that was, you know, Kurt said he was going to reform Christianity and I could tell that he was secretly anti-Christian. So mm -hmm. I just wanted him to drop the mask. And I think he, he dropped it harder than I ever expected. Yeah. Uh, I think you'd made him drop it. Like, yeah. I was, that was great. I, I enjoyed Thank it. Thank I'm you. I'm like, yeah. You know, <laughs> I think that video has more comments than any other video. It's like close to 700 at this point. Have you connected with him after it all or? No. No. Yeah. No, that was, that was pretty wild. I don't, I don't think he would want to come back on even though he was on the live stream afterwards claiming that he won in the comments i don't know if you saw that when i was yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. What, what debate were you watching yeah right but i mean I'm, I'm not a debater like i'm not like jay where i have this history of like studying logic and philosophy and intellectual categories and i know the different fall like i don't know any of that it's a fallacy yeah. i don't know any of that stuff um i just i don't know i just i pick up on what people are saying and i just try to poke at it yeah in the debate which is not the way that Jay debates, but it's, uh, I think it served its purpose in the Kurt Doolittle one, certainly. Yeah, I agree. I'm not even talking about a debate necessarily with Peugeot, just, uh, just like hashing it out. It doesn't even have to be a public conversation. Man. Yeah. And I would, if, it, if it's a private one, it's a private one. I think, I think it would be a big draw for the Orthodox YouTube community to see a public one. I do like, like this, uh, Askren Paul fight coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Not for sure. We're bringing the whole fighting community together. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, it's, it, there's something happening. I mean, communities are emerging and I try to stay away from these grandiose ideas and trying to, you know, but something's happening and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, at least, uh, uh be watching or be a part of it and, and having conversations like these. And I'm just going to keep following my intuition of who I talk to and what to read and, um, and kind of let the Holy spirit guide me, man. That's it. Yeah. Well, if, if John's up, up for a debate, I'm happy to happy to do it. We'll do pay per view. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> we're not trailer. Fifty bucks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. People yeah, would man. probably pay it at this point. There's so much lore to the to the story at this point. Yeah, <laughs> I would. Uh, you know, I'd be happily uh, promote that as well. So, yeah, we'll see, man. I won't keep you any longer. You've been uh, very gracious with your time. We're at an hour and a half here. Um, I'll link to your uh, channel and the books that you've uh, written. Oh, thank do you. Have a book on poetry as well. I do. I think I have it over here. So I have a book called Theo Poetica, okay. Poems nice. and Essays. So this is uh, 20 poems that I wrote, plus uh, a little essay on each one. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, three essays on uh, the state of poetry as an art in general, uh, how it got the way it is, because it's really bad right now in America. Mm -hmm. Poetry is, uh, there's no form, there's no structure. So classical poetry like Shakespeare, Longfellow, Dante, that's the stuff that actually is sublime and actually uplifts the soul because beauty is of God, right? Mm -hmm. Order is logos. So when you have poetry that has order to it and structure and rhyme scheme, that, that orders your mind and heart and soul in a way that modern quote unquote poetry just yeah. doesn't. It's like a random thought with a line break in the middle and they call it a poem. That's not what a poem is. You know, it's supposed yeah. to be an art form. It's supposed Definitely. to be uplifting. Have you, so, are you familiar with Tim Petitza's book, uh, The Ethics of Beauty? I don't think so. And it's, uh, it's, it, the idea is, is kind of beauty will save the world. It's a very deeply orthodox book. It just came out last oh. year. It's called the What's ethics of beauty. Uh, let me see if I my, can uh, find it real quick. Hold. Yeah. Let me put that in my little Google, uh, Google thing. Ethics of beauty. Ethics of beauty. Oh, by St. Nicholas, uh, press. Oh, it really is an orthodox book. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and, and, okay. you know, a book this thick sounds like a Roger Scruton, uh, type of thing. Yeah, you, you know, a lot of book like this usually has um, a lot of fluff in it. Look how thick it is, right? Yeah. Every yeah. page, not even exaggerating, is so in depth with orthodoxy that this was helped oh. me convert, reconvert, not convert, but re really come back to, to orthodoxy. I don't know that it sold out, and I don't know that they've reprinted it yet, but I think it's in the process of. of I just saw it on Amazon. Yeah, is it is it for sale still, or is it it's uh, unavailable? It, it looked like it. Yeah. Um, it, no, you're right. It's not. Wow. It's 748 pages. Yeah. I have a, on my YouTube channel, one of my uh, playlist is reading from several chapters. So mm. uh, check it out, man. I really just rich and deep. And it's, it talks about the, the, the difference between the truth first approach, which is like psychoanalysis. When you go to a shrink, you sit down and he has his pad and he's analyzing you based on your speech, right? 
uh, mm. juxtaposed with orthodox beauty first approach, right? When you go to a spiritually cultivated spiritual father and you confess your sins, right? He gives your sins to God and it heals right. you, right? And he, right. he's not dogging the truth first approach. He's saying that it's incomplete and we need a beauty f- truth approach. And he goes into like PTSD, uh, uh, soldiers coming home from war and goes to the history of of uh, orthodox soldiers fighting in war and coming home. That's the first part of the book. So yeah, I highly recommend it uh, to check Very it out. Cool. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. I will have a look at it. Yeah, man. Yeah, dude. And uh, thanks a lot. I'm going to post to your stuff here and I'll probably have this kind of uploaded uh, probably within the next day or so. And, um, and I appreciate you. Thank you. God bless. I'm happy to share your video on my, uh, on my channel, get you some more subs if uh, possible. So thank you for having me on. I appreciate the conversation and uh, best of luck and God bless. Yeah, man. Yeah. uh, Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless. All right. Thanks, man. You too. See you you later.